Hi, I'm uh, Duong Wei, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon in Toronto. Thank you, Neil, for inviting me to uh, do this uh, talk. We're going to go through the approach to the knee, and then hopefully give you some insight in terms of how I approach the anatomy of the knee, diagnosis, imaging, as well as uh, treatment of common diagnosis. So we're going to focus on anatomy, some clinical pearls, and then my general algorithm for approach to treatment based on the diagnosis. So basically the anatomy is to consider the collateral ligaments. So the medial collateral ligament as well as the lateral collateral ligaments and the two cruciates ACL, PCL, they all act uh, together to stabilize the knee in conjunction with the uh, bone anatomy as well as the meniscus. So all injuries are important. And then in terms of treatment, uh, they're all important as well in terms of uh, stabilizing the knee. You also have to consider the quadriceps tendons, was patellar tendon, uh, meniscus injuries, was cartilage injury, as well as uh, bony constraint in terms of fractures or bone contusions or osteochondral defect. And then when you approach the knee in terms of uh, uh, the anatomy, you have to approach it through layers of the knee. And from a surgical perspective, you address the knee through uh, multiple layers through the medial side was lateral side and address uh, which layer is injured and then at the time of the repair, you have to actually go through the same systematic process in terms of stabilizing the layers, depending on which uh, structure is injured. So on the medial side, there's three structures, three layers, from the MCL down to the capsule, the right neck limb, as well as the MPFL on the second layer. On the lateral side, from a surgical pr perspective, you have to go through uh, every layer in terms of addressing the meniscus, to the lateral side, the LCL ligaments, as well as the lateral right neck limb as well. And this is more for surgical repair as well as surgical reconstruction, uh, correlating with an MRI and then addressing the injury. So in the history, uh, I usually focus on particular items uh, that I like to uh, get from the patient. So the time since the injury is important for multiple diagnoses, including patella tendons was quadriceps tendon. There's some urgency to do repair before retraction of the tendon, as well as uh, the meniscus, a uh, buccal handle tear, uh, requires urgent treatment before plastic deformation of the meniscus within six to eight weeks, optimizes injury, so diagnosis is crucial, both from a physical exam point of view, as well as imaging point of view. Whether there was contact versus non-contact, so most injuries to the knee are non-contact. If you have contact involved in history, you have to consider higher impact force injuries to the bone as well as uh, potentially the severity of the injury. Whether the foot is plantar or not, it's important as well in terms of determining the amount of torque that goes to that injury at the time of impact as well as position of the body as well as other players in the field. Whether you hear a pop, uh, can help you localize the injury or point to the particular diagnosis, whether it's a ligament injury like an ACL or a bony contusion, as well as a pop in the patella uh, out of joint. Whether the athlete is able to continue to play if the injury is important in terms of function and the severity of the injury, the patient can't walk, you have to worry about fractures that we're going to talk in the next few slides, as well as uh, if they can't play, uh, something is definitely wrong in terms of management on the field. And you can test them out from a simple strain to the MCL to more um, severe injury to the multiple ligaments of the knee. If the patient has adhesion, there's something wrong in the knee and you are obliged to investigate until uh, the diagnosis is found in terms of uh, determining why the knee is, is it swollen as well as the exact cause of the effusion. And after you've done all through the steps, you have to actually look into it in terms of are they still able to play? If they're able to play and they don't have any pain, uh, typically um, they don't have a functional problem, so it's hard to justify surgery. They're unable to play, they already tested the knee out, then it's a question of uh, discussing surgical uh, planning as well as rehab and return to play time frame. So acute knee injury and things not to miss. An open injury, so when you actually address the knee, you have to actually look at the knee, make sure there's no obvious skin compromise. Look for skin compromise, skin tenting, skin buckling, like a knee dislocation. You would have buckling of the medial side with the medial collateral ligaments, as well as the medial meniscus, entrapped into the knee. 
That's a rare injury. Uh, and as well as open patellar fracture, quadriceps extensor mechanism injury. Look for fractures, so Pittsburgh decision rules. They can't walk, swollen knee, x-ray. You don't want to miss the fractures. Dislocation, compare both sides, expose both knees. Look for deformity, x-rays. Uh, if uh, you have any doubt in terms of uh, any change in terms of uh, the normal alignment of the knee as compared to both sides. You should also address the joint above, which is the hip as well as the ankle. Make sure there's no radiating or compromising or distracting injuries. And do a thorough neurovascular injury uh, assessment. So palpate the pulses, dorsalis pedis pulse as well as DBS posterior pulse. In doubt, take your time, sit down, relax, assess the pulse. Uh, compare both sides in doubt, just uh, do an ABI or ankle brachial index with the Doppler. Uh, if you have any question that there was a dislocation of the knee that's uh, missed uh, occasionally, then order a CT angiogram, console vascular surgery. It's a bad injury to miss. Uh, and then assess the calf as well as the thigh, more chronic injury, patients have been mobilized in the Zim brace or any form of uh, casting. Look for swelling that's abnormal tender calf, tender uh, thigh, and order a Doppler ultrasound to rule out DVT. If patient has an acute blunt injury uh, at impact, uh, contact, or tackle, assess the compartments, pain out of proportion to the injury, unable to uh, get the patient comfortable, assess the compartments, uh, console orthopedics. You can use either a special device called striker or arterial line, and then go through all the compartments of the thigh or the leg, or the uh, various layers and then adjust the pressure and compare uh, with the um, uh, standards or with uh, diastolic pressure. Uh, look for extensor mechanism rupture as an extensor lag. We'll go through that through the subsequent slides in terms of not missing quadriceps tendon rupture, patella fracture, or patella tendon rupture. So the uh, physical examination is systematic. Uh, make sure you look. Uh, at the skin, look at deformity, feel, move, and do, do special testing. I have a certain uh, order to my exam. As long as you don't miss uh, any step, you can use any mnemonic you want. Uh, but look for skin compromise, erythema, atrophy, deformity as well as swelling. Those are my first steps in terms of the inspection. The extensor lack is demonstrated on these two slides. So at the top, you ask the patient to strain the knee, you support the ankle, then you can just uh, support uh, the calf and let go of the ankle and ask the patient to uh, uh, extend and keep the extension uh, alive, uh, so to speak. If they have an extensor mechanism rupture, they're unable to do this, the, uh, this maneuver with a uh, violation of the quadriceps tendon, patellar fracture or patellar tendon tear, or in the pediatric patient, a tibial tuberosity fracture revulsion. And then you go through the palpation part. So palpate AV, uh, bony uh, landmarks, looking for fractures, looking for bony tenderness. So going systematically through the tibia, through the tibia plateau, tibia tuberosity, girdish tubercle, insertion of the IT band, fibular head, make sure there's no evulsion fracture of the proximal fibula with a possible lateral corner injury, LCL evulsion fractures, biceps femoris evulsion fractures, and then go to the medial lateral joint line, palpate systematically from anterior to posterior, looking for joint line tenderness for either uh, arthritis, cartilage defects, more anteriorly to the more posterior aspect of the medial lateral joint line for meniscal tear. Then you go to the proximal mid aspect as well as distal aspect of the MCL as well as the LCL or the collateral ligaments and assess for tenderness. If it's not tender, typically an acute injury, it's uh, not torn. The uh, subsequent, uh, Locations of palpation are the medial lateral femoral condyles, looking for evulsions of the proximal ligaments on the lateral side, as well as the epicondyles, uh, again, for evulsion injuries. Once you've uh, finished the palpation, you go through a special testing. So testing for stability of the knee, so the MCL, LCL. I do this test uh, at zero degrees as well as 30 degrees. And at 30 degrees, you unlock the bony uh, conformity as well as the bony restraint and test specifically for the MCL as well as LCL. The thigh stabilized on the leg, so you have bigger patient, uh, line back, um, uh, bigger patient, bigger MBI, uh, BMI, it's easier to actually stabilize the thigh and just focus mainly on the knee 
you support the ankle and the tibia with your hand and you perform a varus and valgus stressing and looking for uh, opening and compare that to the contralateral side if you're not sure. Once you follow through the collateral ligaments, I focus then on the cruciates, uh, look at the Lachman for the ACL, uh, the anterior drawer, as well as the pivot shift test, so the three tests of the ACL. There are other tests you can do as well, but I uh, specifically focus on the Lachman, which uh, we'll show in the subsequent slides. The posture drawer test for me uh, is more so for the PCL, and you're looking for a SAG, we'll go through that as well. And again, more special testing, uh, harder to do, looking for posture lateral corner injury with the reverse pivot test, the dial test in uh, either prone or supine position, and external, like the external rotation recurvatum test, again for posture lateral corner injury. And you don't want to miss a posture lateral corner injury in the setup of ACL. Uh, which uh, can augment the instability of the knee as well as uh, uh, compromise the ACL reconstruction integrity over the uh, rehab period. Looking for joint line tennis as well as McMurray uh, and uh, associated with an effusion uh, will be um, consistent with the meniscus uh, tear injuries. So for the ACL part uh, is the primary restraint to enter tibial translation also responsible for any pivoting or cutting maneuver, which is more important to patients. Uh, proprioception in terms of the uh, fibers of the ACL, helping uh, determine whether the knee is in space. And unfortunately, when the ACL tears, it doesn't heal, uh, unlike the collateral ligaments, as well as the other ligaments of the knee. So the uh, picture on the left shows an ACL tear. Uh, and then on the uh, right is an MRI diagnosis of a tear with an arrow sign. You have to look at uh, which bundle is torn, whether it's intermedial or postlateral or both, which also would correlate with the amount of instability that the patient will complain of. And from a clinical patient perspective, the postlateral bundle is uh, more symptomatic for the patient uh, in terms of uh, unable or the ability to cut and pivot during the sports activities. So the Lachman test, it's important to know how to describe uh, both from a communication point of view as well as your exams. Um, and then in my practice, is the best test for the ACL. It's easier to do uh, if you get the patient to relax uh, in your clinic rooms with the knee flex at 20 to 30 degrees, the thigh supported. You have to be relaxed, otherwise the patient will resist. Uh, with the right hand on that picture, you can determine the uh, relaxation of the hamstrings and then make sure the patient's fully relaxed. And you have to warn the patient that you're testing the ACL. You're not gonna hurt them. It's a very gentle test. You don't have to crank on the knee. And then you stabilize the femur as well as the tibia through the process. You drop off the tibia off the table and then straddle the ankle for support. And it's a firm anterior translation forced on the tibia while the right hand in this picture or the video supports the, the thigh. I assess the extent of the translation based on one to two to three in terms of five uh, millimeter increments of uh, instability uh, and then either with a firm endpoint uh, determining potential partial tear or still remaining uh, intact or physiological uh, laxity versus a soft endpoint which would indicate a full tear. So the video shows the Lachman test for the ACL uh, and then it's on the website for your reference, so I will, uh, won't dwell on it in this uh, presentation. You can refer that on the website. And then uh, again, the anterior posture drawer test for me is, uh, the anterior drawer test is less reliable for me uh, in my practice for the ACL. I use it more for the PCL as a start point, and you have to actually identify the step off and compare that to the contralateral side. And then for the PCL, the posture door test is graded from one to two to three based on the displacement we can obtain uh, from the tibia in reference to the femur. And then grade one, the tibia is still entered the femoral condyle. You're able to park your uh, tip of your thumb and the step off to the, f the, uh, the tibia is flush to the femoral condyle. So you won't able to palpate that same step off. And three, the translation is uh, great enough that the tibia plateau falls posture to the femoral condyle. The pivot shift test is a pathognomonic for an ACL tear. It's a 
challenging to do this in the clinical setting, in the office due to the patient's pain as well as guarding, in the operating room as in this video, uh, you can uh, see the extension to flexion test, and then in extension the ACL is uh, torn and the knee is dislocated, uh, you're looking for reduction of the knee, pulled by the IT band on the girdis tubercle, uh, with an axial load, vagal stress, and internal rotation force, as you go from extension to flexion test, the knee will reduce, indicating uh, a full ACL tear. This is a patient of mine, a gymnast, is able to do a self uh, dislocation of the, of the tibia on the femur, so a full uh, anterior drawer as well as pivot shift test is quite impressive. He also has some lax on the contralateral side, so you have to compare. And then again, this is on the website for your reference. Absolutely. So the, this is uh, the knee exam. Uh, I go through the whole exam from the effusions, as well as the lobman, the extensor lag, as well as collateral ligament testing, palpation, as well as special testing with Lockman posture drawer tests, reverse pivot shift tests, dial tests, extension recuperatum tests. Uh, and then again, this is detailed on the website. You can uh, look at, at your leisure as well with explanation and and uh, details about the uh, specifics of each individual test. So this uh, video demonstrates the postural lateral drawer test. It's uh, similar to the postural drawer test, except I put the tibia in extra rotation. This patient has had a previous uh, postural lateral corner. Uh, this is a revision setting, and you can in see both the posture as well as anterior instability. But with the uh, right hand, you can force the knee in rotation and address the uh, rotational uh, instability in the knee as well. So once you've uh, uh, gone through the history, narrow down the diagnosis based on your history in terms of severity, location of the pain, as well as ability of the patient to return to sports or not. Go through your physical exam in terms of uh, specifically narrow down exactly what uh, the injury is and come up with some working diagnosis, then you can discuss uh, uh, surgical as well as non-surgical treatment. Um, there's uh, various modalities you can order from x-rays to uh, uh, MRIs, ultrasound, uh, and then uh, based on the diagnosis, recommend surgical and non-surgical treatment. In my practice, as long as the patient does not have a fracture, uh, then it's uh, usually weight bearing as tolerated with crutches, um, and to determine whether actually a patient has a meniscal tear or not. Patients have a hinge brace to allow early mobilization. I don't immobilize the patient due to either delay rehab as well as stiffness, arthrofibrosis as well as DVT prevention. Uh, avoid any valves of various stress uh, as well as ice and Tylenol anti-inflammatories to decrease the pain swelling uh, and to protect the knee uh, but move the knee. So for specifically for the ACL uh, tear, once you're diagnosed with ACL tear, both on this history as well as physical exam and MRI, uh, my indications for ACL reconstruction is in a motivated patient. It's hard to motivate a patient after the surgery, so you have to ensure that, uh, explain to them that the surgery is the easy part, the rehab is uh, definitely the hard part. It's a long process, six months to nine months to a year, depending on the ability of the patient to dedicate time to the rehab. Uh, they have to be uh, athletically inclined. Uh, so a patient that does only frontal plane exercise can potentially get away uh, without ACL reconstruction. You just have to indicate and explain to them the natural history of uh, unstable knee uh, with development of arthritis as well as meniscal tears and warn them about cutting pivoting activities. The desire to return to previous level activities also important. Uh, as I uh, already mentioned, cutting and pivoting are the uh, usually activities a patient cannot compensate for. Uh, and then most of my patients try to go and cut and pivot and they can't do it and that's why they come to me for surgery. And then the goal also is to discuss long-term history as well as natural history of unstable knee. Uh, and it, then the, the younger the patient, actually the longer the discussion is in terms of preventing meniscal tear as well as carnage defects and arthritis in the future. So there's various ways to do the ACL reconstruction from quadricep tendon harvest, patella tendon harvest with a bone patella bone, hamstring harvest, as well as using a donor, donor cadaver graft. In my practice, I discuss all the pros and cons 
each has their own complications. You have to tell the patient exactly what the complication is, as well as uh, literature up to date, and then let the patient decide. And then on the fixation side, uh, there's multiple procedures, a lot of variables. Every surgeon uh, is different. Uh, there's a lot of research on every possible ways to do this operation. In my practice at this point, I use a suspensory cortical fixation. You can transfix with a pin uh, or use interfering screws. You can use a post and a washer or a screw and a washer and tie it uh, or other fixation that you can use. Uh, regardless of the fixation, as long as you're able to achieve time zero fixation with full extensions, full motion, then it's just a matter of healing as well as adequate rehab, as well as uh, compliance uh, from the patient's side, as well as uh, uh, appropriate return to play timeframes. My practice also, um, I perform pediatric physis sparing or growth plate sparing ACL reconstruction. This is uh, come uh, to be uh, more common than the past due to newer techniques as well as instrumentation. It's very hard to keep uh, a young teenage uh, athlete quiet uh, in terms of not being able to run or cut and pivot, either in sports or at school and in gym class. And the goal is to prevent meniscal injury. It's uh, understandably a longer discussion in terms of uh, risk and complications to the growth plate, as well as operating a young patient with all the risk uh, from uh, potentially anesthesia as well as a uh, routine risk of surgery. But uh, regardless, we're moving towards uh, a reconstructing the knee in an anatomical fashion to again stabilize the knee and avoid further complications from meniscal tear as well as cartilage defect that we see within two years from the injury. And again, we can avoid the growth plate. You can do all epiphyseal, where you can stay below the growth plate on the femur, which is a more important growth plate to uh, be careful of, as well as you can stay also on the epiphysis on the proximal tibia and achieve all your fixation within uh, the epiphysis distal to the growth plates. So once uh, we adjust the ACL uh, and the pediatric ACL, then um, we can address the MCL as well as LCL. In my practice, MCL is almost invariably always torn, be able to protect with the hinge braids, early motion, and re-examine the knee within three to four weeks. Usually the MCL would heal. Most of the MCL injuries heal, and if you have an unhealed MCL, it's usually distal, it's uh, uncommon, and associated typically with other injuries, and then uh, this will be the only time that you might consider MCL reconstruction in the acute knee injury. Similarly, for the LCL injuries, most of them heal, as long as they're not uh, associated with uh, postlateral corner injuries, as well as ACL injuries. And then it's just a matter of uh, hinge bracing the patient, early motion, protect that various force, and re-examine the knee within three or four weeks to determine stability of the knee. So in, the, in my practice, MCL surgery is in conjunction with uh, postural medial corner injury, ACL, PCL injury, or knee dislocation with reconstruction of the MCL, LCL, as well as ACL, PCL injury. Uh, that's more severe of an injury. And the postural corner injury is a bit more common than MCL injuries. You don't want to miss this injury, so uh, as you go through the physical exam, make sure you go through a dial test, extension recorandum test, and postural lateral drawer test uh, to ensure you don't miss a postural corner injury, which has to be done in conjunction with ACL reconstruction, otherwise ACL will fail. This is just an arthroscopic picture of PCL reconstruction. Typically in my practice, either you have a grade one, two, or three in a posture drawer test. Uh, it's usually non-surgical if it's an isolated PCL injury. If you have associated that ACL PCL injury, uh, then you should reconstruct both to stabilize the knee. If you have a PCL and a postural lateral corner injury, again, you have to reconstruct both and this applies to uh, any injury to the PCL plus one other ligaments in the knee. So next we we'll move on to uh, the MPFL, which is the main stabilizer of the patella. This is a very common injury, and then uh, we've uh, moved our focus from a distal stabilization or distal reconstruction with a transfer of the tibial tuberosity in the Falkelson uh, procedure to more proximal reconstruction and provide anatomical reconstruction 
with hopefully less uh, disruption to the extensor mechanism. So in my practice, uh, the MPFL is addressed uh, on the MRI as well as the time of the exam. So palpating the uh, insertion of the MPFL on the proximal one-third, two-thirds of the patella as well as palpating the medial epicondyle and the adductor tubercle where the origin of the MPFL uh, is located. There's a little saddle that you can feel on the medial side of the knee uh, and then it's uh, uh, very indicative of the origin of the MPFL. And then on the MRI, you're looking for tears, disruption, looking for OCD injuries, so medial facet fractures or OCD fractures of the medial facet, as well as uh, bone bruising on the lateral femoral condyle. The injury occurs at the time of reduction. So when the patella is dislocated, and it's reduced either by the patient extending the knee or by the uh, emergency provider as they attempt to reduce the patella. On the MRI, you'll see this disruption. Again, the MPFL is torn out of the femur on this MRI on the right. Uh, on the left, there's a clinical picture of a sublux or dislocated patella, and then it's reduced uh, through extension of the knee and stabilization and extension uh, for a few days to a week, and early mobilization in the brace for non surgical cases. If you have uh, indication to be uh, going to the operating room for an MPFL uh, injury, such as an OCD fracture or OCD lesion, or some other procedure you have to do with a meniscal tear, then at the time of the surgery, I would placate the MPFL depending on the injury uh, location on the MRI, whether it's uh, off the patella or off the femur, or whether it's an intra-substance uh, tear of the MPFL. In this case, if it is intra-substance, uh, you can imbricate or reef the uh, MPFL or do arthroscopic placation and try to tighten up the MPFL as part of your other concomitant procedures. If the tear happens off the patella or the femur, then I would do a formal medial open uh, procedure where I would put anchors on the medial side uh, on the patella or the uh, uh, femur and then try to placate the MPFL. In a recurrent uh, dislocator, uh, the MPFL has stretch, and in this case, I'll do a formal MPFL reconstruction, use a hamstring of the semitendinosus of the hamstrings, and create either one or two anchor docks on the patella, and then do a formal MPFL reconstruction, which is a very strong reconstruction. You have to mobilize the patient on an early basis to avoid stiffness. It's stronger than uh, you think, and you don't need the uh, same amount of force uh, in terms of stabilizing the MPFL, so you don't want to over-constrain this uh, MPFL uh, surgery, uh, much like you do for an ACL reconstruction. So moving on to the meniscus, medial as well as lateral side. Uh, it's very important to uh, save these and to diagnose early. You have a six-week time frame uh, from the time of injury as well as to the um, the surgery uh, outcomes are dropping uh, if you uh, miss a diagnosis or you wait too long. Uh, in a younger patient, it's very important to diagnose early. So as long as there's no fractures, hinge brace, move the knee, they have not achieved full extension by three weeks. You have to be concerned of potential lock knee or unstable meniscus with a displaced uh, meniscus in the notch blocking for extension. Uh, you have to pick up the phone, talk to a radiologist and try to obtain an urgent MRI, and then urgent surgery if it's confirmed on MRI with a meniscal tear or displaced meniscal tear. Then you call your orthopedic surgeon friend to try to arrange this on an urgent basis. The younger the patient, the more critical this uh, time frame is in terms of trying to save the meniscus, and then obtain a meniscus uh, repair that's healed. And then if you're able to catch this within six weeks, it's a fairly high success rate depending on the extent of the tear, location of the tear in terms of blood supply, as well as the, uh, uh, the extent of the cartilage injury. And then it goes from anywhere from 65 to 90% success rate. If you do it properly, rehab properly, you have a compliant patient, and you follow the appropriate uh, length of the rehab, which is six months to nine months to a year before returning to sports, depending on the severity as well as the location of the tear. So my clinical pearls is you have to know the anatomy, otherwise you don't know where to palpate, and you have to look for the injury 
uh, based on the history, based on the mechanism, the position of the knee at the time of impact or injury, contact, position of the player, as well as uh, speed, circumstance, what they're trying to do at the time, try to re reproduce it in your mind. Go for the anatomy, look for common injuries, like an MCL on the, meat on the left side, as well as a Sagan fracture on the right, where the arrow is in terms of evulsion of the capsule, and this is a path pathognomonic for an ACL injury. The key concept on the physical exam, uh, as discussed for me in my practice, uh, in a busy practice, uh, the Lockman is the best test for the ACL. There's the uh, least amount of guarding. If you do it properly, it requires a lot of practice, uh, and then practice makes perfect. Uh, and then obviously, the, if you relax, the patient will relax, will generate a better uh, result. The posture drawer test uh, is the best test for the PCL, obviously. I use that more for PCL rather than the ACL. And again, it's different grades. If you have an as a PCL injury, it's usually non-surgical, regardless of the grade. If it's associated with other injuries, then you have to consider surgery. The valgus testing and varus testing at 0 to 30 degrees, looking for the collateral ligament injuries. Uh, and then you don't want to miss the posture jaw, extra rotation, as well as the dial test and the reverse pivot uh, shift test, indicative of posture lateral corner injuries. Key concepts on Im imaging, so look for evulsion fractures uh, on x-rays, and then this is where your palpation is important. Ultrasound, my practice for quadricep as well as patella tendon only. Uh, do not uh, rely on this for more internal injuries such as cartilage or meniscus or ligament injuries. This is your physical exam as well as in doubt, go to the MRI uh, in terms of uh, imaging. MRI is essentially the best test for all pathology uh, in terms of cartilage, meniscus, and ligaments. It's not super 100% perfect for cartilage, but you can uh, uh, have uh, an idea in terms of the extent of the injury. Again, MRI is challenging to obtain. Uh, depending on where you are. Uh, but again, if you're concerned about the injury based on the story, as well as your physical exam, then try to pick up the phone, and talk to a radiologist, try to expedite the MRI for the sake of the patient. The key concept on surgical indications, so ACL reconstruction, uh, usually uh, young, and then young is relative depending on, on what you do in life. Uh, and uh, active, so they want to do something in terms of cutting, pivoting, uh, and then you don't want severe arthritis, potentially causing a lot of pain after surgery once you stabilize the knee, and then the patient is unable to cut or pivot, uh, and have tried already, or they're willing to try, or it's something that they're passionate about, then it's very hard to compensate for an ACL deficient knee with those specific activities, and therefore surgery is the next step. MCL tears, most of the time will heal unless the distal, which is uh, rare, or if they're associated with other ligament injuries, which will require reconstruction. PCL usually non-surgical regardless of the grade, uh, so the posture drawer test is relevant and important if associated with other injuries. Uh, so any other ligament injury in addition to PCL uh, would equal surgery in my practice. And then LCL tear, usually again non-surgical, as long as they're not associated with a possible lateral corner injury, other ligament injuries, just as ACLs was um, MCL injuries, which indicate potentially a, a more severe knee injury uh, with a knee dislocation. That's it. Thank you very much, Tuan. Thank you.